Good day, Junior Tuckies, and to anybody who is watching this English Home ling Language lesson on punctuation for grade 8 and 9 students. This is actually the second video, so I do suggest that you try and find the first video and have a look at that too, so that we can really understand our punctuation. But before we dive right in, allow me to introduce myself to you. My name is Miss Langtree and I have created this lesson here today. And yes, I am very, very excited to be presenting this lesson. I think that punctuation is very important indeed. As mentioned previously, um, as we can see from our table of contents here, we have actually covered up to here. So we have done the first four punctuation symbols on our to-do list. Oh gosh, that is a that one's better, yes. <laughs> and today we are going to be doing the um, from the colon all the way down to the hyphen. So if you don't have a notebook and a pen out as of yet, I do strongly suggest that you do so and you write down some basic rules which are going to help you with pretty much every sentence that you are going to be writing for the foreseeable future. No pressure. <laughs> Right, so the first rule which we are going to be looking at today is the colon. Now, this is a punctuation mark that is essentially two dots in front of one. I mean, actually on top of one another, as can be seen over uh, there. <laughs> okay, so that is what they look like. And when you see a colon in a sentence, you are almost guaranteed that some concept, some idea is about to be introduced to us, right? This is the punctuation mark that serves as an introduction. And one can use it to introduce a person if they are looking for some sort of emphasis or drama to take place. As we can see here, ladies and gentlemen, the queen. Do you see how the colon adds that sort of suspenseful something's about to happen and then he makes this announcement. Then this is actually a quote that I have heard <laughs> from somebody so um, they turned around and they said once there is only one love in my life the University of Pretoria and you can just see the dramatic flair of the sentence okay only one love in my life you can't get much more dramatic than that and that's why a colon is so appropriate here because it allows for that pause it allows for that suspense to to grow who is this person's love of their life and then she says the University of Pretoria so we have a bookworm on our hands here <laughs> and of course one can also use it to introduce a list so say for example you need to go to the mall you write you might write at the top of the page something like that and then you will start to say I need socks I need this and this and this and then you will start writing your list okay so to do today try my best boy I wish I wish that was the only thing on my to-do list but at the end of the day it really is the only thing on our to-do list so if you're here and you're busy trying to expand your knowledge then you are definitely definitely doing really really w well when it comes to trying your best anyway so this symbol therefore allows for something to follow if you see it something is about to follow it can be used for emphasis or introductions of some sort. I actually have been using colons throughout the slide, so we naturally see them. Okay, and the reason I could use these colons is because every time I am writing something, I am about to introduce it to you. Do you see the colon and then some sort of explanation follows suit, and therefore, um, colons, yes, are actually used more than perhaps we have thought before. Right, let us move on to the apostrophe. It is a very unassuming symbol. It is quite small. If you're not concentrating, perhaps you might miss it. Basically, it is just something like this. So if, say, for example, I'm writing an S, I just put my little apostrophe over there. Okay, and that signifies one of two things. Let's look at what the apostrophe is for. 
Okay, it's got two purposes, either omission or possession. It's a good idea to write these two words down, okay? Um, I say this because they often do say, what is the purpose of this apostrophe? And now you must be able to say, well, it's showing possession, and you kind of explain why. So, yes, please do write these two main words down. Let us have a look at what omission means. Right, when we speak, we often leave certain syllables out of sentences to help it flow a little easier. We are all humans. When we start talking and we start talking quickly, sorry, I keep on, I keep on expressing with my hand and my pencil keeps on hitting my microphone. That must be extremely loud for you. <laughs> I do apologize. Um, but when we start to express ourselves really quickly when we're talking to our friends, certain syllables, by that I mean certain beats in the sentence do fall away. And we can reenact that through our writing. And let me show you how we can make that happen. So, instead of saying, is it not cold outside? Okay, I don't see us chatting to each other like that on a normal day. What we could say is, isn't it cold outside? Okay, take a close look at the formal language here and take a closer look, okay, at the fact that we said I-S-N apostrophe T, pronounced isn't, and we managed to reenact this more long-winded a group of words. <laughs> I can't think of the correct terminology, but yes. Okay, so basically the purpose of an apostrophe is to make sure that certain letters are replaced, but it's not the end of the world. Okay, so here I am. I am removing certain letters, as you can see on the slide here. Okay, and then I-S-N-T with an apostrophe is now good English once again. Okay, so that is how the apostrophe can be used. I hope that you all understand that. Okay, let's have a look here. Isn't it quicker than to just say, is it not? And the apostrophe helps this to happen. Examples of where omission can take place include wouldn't, okay, previously would not. Okay, couldn't, could not, shouldn't, should not. Do you see the pattern here? They merge. The apostrophe kind of signifies, yes, these two words have merged. And yes, certain letters are gone. And so I'm just going to pop an apostrophe in there and be forgiven. Okay, um, won't actually means um, would not or no, it wouldn't. It would mean will not, will not, can't. Um, I cannot. And there, should we take a closer look at this there? Okay, and there, they are. So, oh, where is Henry? There over there would be said like so, will be written. There over there. Okay, so this, they are, they actually sound the same. Okay, but they have different spellings. Can anybody tell me what type of words these are then? There is a, it begins with a hum, hum. Okay, well, you can write it in the comments for me. But anyway, this signifies they are over there, which signifies the location. Same words, different spelling. Okay, and then there's obviously the third one. Whilst I'm on this tangent, there is actually possession. Right, so, oh, it is their doll. Okay, shows that the doll belongs to them. Those are the three theirs. I understand you didn't ask for that, but you got it. Enjoy. <laughs> Right, then, the next way in which an apostrophe can be used is for possession, okay? So, let's have a look at our notes and see if we can understand everything that is being said to us. Sorry, guys, there we go. Okay, so, 
An apostrophe helps the reader understand the ownership of something. It signifies who is in possession of the object. So let's have a look at our example over here. The cat's, the cat's food. Okay, notice the apostrophe. Then the cat's food. Okay, the apostrophe is before the S in this case and after the S in that case. And it's crazy how such a tiny line can make all the difference. Let's unpack this further. Here the apostrophe is helping us understand the relationship between the cat and the food. It is the cat's food, so hence we read this and understand ownership. The apostrophe also helps us to see that there is either a singular cat or multiple cats who possess the food. Okay. If the apostrophe is before the S, then it indicates singular ownership. If you haven't written anything down yet, it's fine. But write this down. Okay. If the apostrophe is found before the S, so it goes like so, there's your apostrophe there, okay, it equals singular, okay, you guys must get in the, in the habit of summarizing what you see on the screen, I know that a lot of people at your age want to write everything word for word, but you can't, okay, you need to start to learn how to summarize, how to see how you can sort of make your notes really compact okay so if you haven't written anything just write cats apostrophe s and definitely circle highlight that apostrophe and then say this means it's a singular cat okay it's the cat's food just one cat's food okay let's look at the example here the girls's water bottles the apostrophe is before the S, so we assume it's one young lady with multiple water bottles for whatever reason that might be. <laughs> right, let's have a look again, um, just below. If the apostrophe is after the S, this signifies that multiple subjects have taken ownership of the object. For example, the girls' water bottle. Okay, now it's multiple young ladies who are in possession of these water bottles. Okay, and in the cat's case, the cat's food, there's definitely more than one cat now. Okay, perhaps they're referring to the SPCA where they hopefully have a room for, full of lovely cat food for our little cats and dogs who might be going hungry if it wasn't for them. Okay, so... Let's quickly look at a different rule. Um, this is a rule where lots of people um, make a mistake. So let's have a look at the bottom here. If the name already ends with an S, the apostrophe has to go after the S, even if the possession is for a singular person. Okay? It is tempting to go like so. Oh, these are Chris's water bottles. Um, no, that is just clumsy, wouldn't you agree? Okay, far better to get rid of that S, but when you say it, you do say, this is Chris's water bottles. Okay, or should it actually, these are Chris's water bottles. Okay, and so that is the rule, even though there's one Chris, we don't have a bus of Chris's, Okay, there's just one Chris, but simply because um, his name ends in an S, the apostrophe goes afterwards. I hope that this has cleared up any confusion for you on the apostrophe. Alrighty, everybody. Now we are going to take a look at what are called inverted commas, commonly known as direct speech marks or speech marks or something like that. And what it essentially means is when you are writing and you want somebody to say something or if you're directly quoting what someone has once said, you need to use these bad boys over here. Okay, you need to use some inverted commas. So say, for example, someone in your story is just staring at you and saying, again? I'm not sure what you did, but I think they're a bit tired of it. Okay, you want that to be in direct speech. You would then put these little brackets around it, like so. Okay, and you can choose. You can choose to do it like that, or you can choose to simply, let me just remove them. 
to just do one. Okay, but we will get into more details about the inverted comma now, but essentially, yes, that is what inverted commas do. Okay, so let's start reading. When writing, it is often a good idea to add dialogue from the characters and to have them speak directly. Okay, so that's these are the punctuation marks associated with that. And the reason why dialogue is so good is because this adds a sort of lightness to the story and helps the reader see more into the way in which a character can articulate their thoughts. And if you're quoting from someone else, it just helps the reader take a break from what you're trying to say and trying to, to gain sort of different perspectives. And in that way, it kind of just gives them a more holistic experience when reading. Okay. So, but how do we punctuate a direct quote? So, here are the steps which we need to know. Okay, you surround the quote with the direct speech marks or the inverted commas so that the reader understands what is said. Okay, what is said and what is being narrated, not directly from the person's mouth. Okay, no two is talking. So that's the, f you must always sort of indicate who is speaking, all right? Note who is talking and try to use the right adjective. N no, sorry guys, it's not an adjective, it's a verb. Okay, to describe how the sentence is said. So let's go back to again over here. Okay, so again. How would this have been said? How could we indicate the tone? We could say, um, Tory sighed and said again, or um, Tory bellowed again. Okay, so you just have to kind of sometimes get creative to help us to help us understand as the reader how these sentences are said. Okay, if, if English is not your favorite thing in the world, you don't have to say, you know, Tori whispered again. You could just say Tori said again. But you can see from our point of view why the more creative your sort of verb that you use to indicate how things are spoken can add some flavor to your story. Okay, I hope you follow. <laughs> okay, use, let's go back to our notes now. Use a comma and then open the speech marks. Then when the quote is over, use punctuation to pause and end the sentence and then close the speech marks. Get this picture of the speech marks sort of framing what is being said. Okay, and the punctuation thereof. So it's comma, open speech marks, say what you want to say, comma, close speech marks and then end it or full stop close speech marks. Okay, let's have a look at some examples. Right, Luvani shouted, let's eat cake. Also note that let's, okay, definitely is using an apostrophe, isn't it? It should be let us eat cake. Okay, but the apostrophe is showing omission. Just a little fun fact for us. Okay, so Luvani shouted, let's eat cake. Right. Notice, I am getting distracted. I do apologize. Sorry, I was trying to change the color of my halata. Okay, but we'll just have to stick with yellow. Yellow is not bad anyway. Okay, um, notice where the punctuation is. Luvani shouted, comma, open up, Open up those speech brackets. Let's eat cake, exclamation point. Okay, and then close the speech brackets. Or it could be said, let's eat cake, exclaimed Lufani. Now just pay careful attention to the fact that the E here is not capitalized. And I am about to tell you something which I hope does not deter you from punctuation forever. Um, Technically, the sentence is not over. Let's eat cake, exclaimed Luvani. Okay, so unless it is a full stop after the direct speech has been spoken, so unless this is a full stop instead of an exclamation point, okay, the letter that follows suit for direct speech only must be lowercase. Okay, so if it was let's eat cake, question mark, exclaimed would look like so. 
it's one of those strange rules which um, we just need to learn okay normally if it's not direct speech any punctuation point you know an, a question mark a um, exclamation mark or a full stop you would have a capital E okay but for some reason when it's direct speech okay it can be it should be lowercase unless it's a full stop okay so let's eat cake exclaimed Lufani full stop now take a look at this one I'd say this is the more complicated one how about uttered Luvani so this is what is being spoken how about okay so they started off with the speech brackets being open how about comma and then they close the speech brackets notice that the comma is before the speech brackets here do you see that guys okay uttered Luvani comma Okay, because now we've clarified who is speaking and we want to move back into our direct speech. So we need to pause. We need to allow for that punctuation. Okay, um, we skip dinner and eat this cake. Hmm. Luvani, you make some choice decisions, if that makes any sense. <laughs> okay, let's look at our third example. Just like that, I do not feel hungry. This is what Jake said as he walked down the bend. Okay, note the ellipsis there from last video. Okay, so you could write it like that. We're still explaining that Jake is the one who is speaking, but we left the direct speech like so. Okay, I hope that this has clarified some things for you. Here we are going to start tackling quite a common um, question that people ask and that is okay so we can use either the sort of double double speech marks as can be seen here so one two inverted commas and then you close off the speech with another two converted commas or do I use this one one inverted commas when do I use which so the rule is you are allowed to use either a single speech mark or two when using direct speech. Okay, it's no problem, but you need to be consistent. Okay, so technically over here, if we look over here, it says, could you help me, asked Sandra, and could you help me, begged Sandra. Main difference being this one uses one, and this one is using two inverted commas, if you can see, both are considered correct. Okay, however, Firstly, you need to be consistent. If you start with one speech bracket, you should also end with one. You cannot use two in the beginning and one at the end and vice versa. Okay. Um, could you help me? Whispered Sandra. This would be considered incorrect because here, like I said, the inverted commas do not correlate so make sure that they do also make sure it correlates throughout your piece of writing if you are going to be using well the the general rule is if you're quoting just use one and if you're actually you know performing some sort of dialogue then you should use two but if you are going to use one be consistent and use it throughout your piece of writing okay if you are writing so I'm here now guys if you are writing in direct speech, so someone is directly speaking, whereby the speaker is quoting another, use the double speech marks first and the singular speech marks within this quote, for example. So this is when you say, okay, but what if, what if I'm now talking and as I'm talking, I'm talking about someone else. So now I've got all these speech brackets flying everywhere. The general rule is start off what that person is saying with the double speech marks. Okay, that sounds incorrect, but yes, with two um, inverted commas. Then as you go along and you are now quoting again, you use your singular inverted commas within the direct speech and you close everything off. You frame the entire part of speech that was said with the double inverted commas once again. Let us see an example of that over here. Tandy stated, today I remember a quote from Nelson Mandela which says that education is the most powerful tool with which we can change the world. Surely we can keep quiet in class then. Quiet. Oh my 
goodness. Okay, could not quite. <laughs> quiet, let's keep quiet in class then. Okay, so do we see here? Okay, we use the double speech marks to frame the entire um, sentence and when she starts quoting another person, we use the singular inverted comma. Do you see? I hope that this adds some clarity. Now we are going to move on to a really, really helpful symbol and that is the question mark. Okay, this is a punctuation mark seen over here. Alright, and it is seen when you are asking a question, when a question is being posed in one way or another. Okay, when someone is searching for an answer in a sentence, it is the question. It helps to look for, a quest for question words, so such as who, what, where, how, and when. If you see these questions, I mean, if you see these words, chances are someone is asking a question, okay? But that's not necessarily the only time someone is asking a question, okay? Have a look at these examples. Are you really going to eat that? Is that seriously all you have to say on the matter? So when someone is clearly seeking clarification and they're asking a question, you pop that question mark there, okay? Now we are going to move on to the exclamation mark. It looks like so. Okay, this is what an exclamation mark looks like. Let me draw one on the side for us. Right, it is a line and a dot. Okay, and this is a punctuation mark which needs to be associated with strong emotion. Right, a punctuation mark is used to emphasize that strong emotion is being used. One is not simply talking calmly when an exc exclamation mark is being used. Even if it says something like, John whispered, get out of there. If there's an exclamation mark, he is, he is still whispering, but he's saying it like with extreme emotion. Do you understand what I mean? Like, get out of there. Okay, instead of just, oh, come on, get out of there. All right, so they really do add a lot to the sentence. It shows the intensity of the situation. So have a look here. Please be quiet. Please be quiet has different connotations. It has a different feeling to please be quiet. Okay, do you see that? I am so happy I could cry as, definite, as differently Oh, sorry. I am so happy that I could cry is read differently to I am so happy I could cry. I think that we need to add in the punctuation here. So, I am so happy that I could cry, full stop. Okay. Or, I am so happy I could cry, ellipsis, three dots in a row. Okay, that trail off means maybe she's not being genuine. I am so happy I could cry, dot, dot, dot. It does leave some suspense in the room. But it's read differently to, I am so happy I could cry, exclamation point. Okay, they are exclaiming this for one reason or another. It can be used for positive emphasis or negative emphasis. Okay, let's have a look over here. When you see words such as demanded, exclaimed, cried, yelled, etc., you can note that an exclamation mark is to follow, particularly um, with demands, if you are learning a second language, if you are seeing an exclamation point or it says, mama demands, pick up the rubbish, you need to know that you need to put an exclamation mark there. Okay, she is not just saying it, she is either yelling it or she is fiercely um, saying the sentence with emphasis. She's got a lot of strong emotion for one reason or another. Okay. However, exclamation marks can be used whenever you want others to understand that the emotional connotation surrounding the sentence is strong. That is your exclamation mark, everybody. Use do not abuse, and you can only use one in a sentence, okay, in terms of um, don't do this where you put three in a row, 
please do not do that. <laughs> okay, we get it. The, it's a strong emotion. You just need to use one. Let's move on to brackets. Brackets look like so. Okay, and then you have your information in the middle and then you close them like so. That is what a bracket is for. And the reason for these symbols, okay, which look like so, not great with the pen yet, um, is that they add extra information which is not absolutely necessary. It's often some kind of quirky detail that we couldn't quite justify adding into the main sentence, okay? But those details really do help us to paint a mental, mental picture as you are writing. Okay, it often helps the reader to see the narrator's character and it adds depth to the sentence. Okay, so let's have a look at some of our examples. Oh, I did one at the bottom here just to kind of show you how the added information can take place. Mrs. Colisi, previously terrible at gymming, is now a yoga instructor. It just adds that extra context and it's a bit of like a cheeky comment as well. So kind of add it into the brackets like, oh, by the way, and then you carry on with your main sentence. Let's look at some other examples over here. Is everyone with me? Okay. She opened the fridge and ate the leftover cake with a grin, might I add. So it just gives us that extra detail. But do you see how it's really, the, the sentence would live without the details added to the brackets. I think it really does, if you are to associate a, a word with the, with the word brackets, it could be something like extra or bonus information. Okay, let's look at the next one. The door, which had just been oiled, squeaked open and frightened me. Okay, so obviously whoever oiled this door did not do a very good job. The baboon, or lion, judging by the size of it, came out of nowhere and tried to open my door. Goodness me, that sounds very stressful. Um, that sentence is actually a true sentence that did happen to me. I thought that the door was locked and the baboon actually did put his hand around and open the door. Um, and I have never jumped so fast in my life and I slammed the door in that baboon's face. And now I'm still here, so there's that. Um, but anyway, so the baboon... Oh, where did the brackets go? Uh, we add the brackets there. Okay, so the baboon or lion, judging by the size of it, came out of nowhere and opened my door. We did not have to add that information in. We could have just said, the baboon came out of nowhere and tried to open my door. But because we add this extra detail, it A, helps you know how dramatic or <laughs> what the narrator thinks is interesting. It adds that extra bit of detail and it helps us to understand the writer a little bit better. So that is the point of brackets. Right, next up we have the dash and it is a singular, relatively long line, okay, that you can find in the middle of the line. So note how it sort of falls, if I was to follow the line of this dash, to the middle, okay, of where the letters would, would be placed on the line. Okay, so what is the point of this little line? Well, a dash can be used to indicate a bit of a pause. Kind of, they're often used when, say, a character is mid-sentence or a narrator is mid-sentence and then, whoop, suddenly something just happens and it's that kind of instant pause. Okay, so let's have a look here. It's going to be legend, wait for it, dairy. I'm not sure if any of you understand the reference, but anyway, to be legendary is um, something that we all strive for, of course. So it's going to be legend, wait for it, dairy. It just kind of adds a very light sort of pause to your sentence. Okay, so then there's also this one here. I was going to hang on, but are you okay? Okay, so kind of that, that pause, perhaps something happened, whereas the person had to trail off and change the subject quite quickly. Or it's like, um, I was going to hang on, but then they notice something different and they go, are you okay? So they kind of change the subject and you can notice that brief pause with the dash, okay? It can 
also be also go before you start listing or pausing for emphasis right so uh, personally I prefer if you're going to start a list that you use a colon which you can use it to make lists and also you can use it for that brief pause um, as said yesterday so it is actually quite similar to the colon one could say in terms of it can be used to introduce things but most of the time it's used for that sort of natural pause in the sentence to add a, a little bit of emphasis but it's definitely not a long pause that the people take okay so that is the dash and finally we are going to talk about one of the last punctuation points for today and that is the hyphen normally when I give this lesson in class my students are not very impressed with me because I say this is a dash guys and this is a hyphen and they ask me but why why is it so complicated um, I'm not sure why but I do know that when you use these punctuation marks in um, a writing exercise there is not one teacher in the world who will um, judge you too much for your dash being too long or your hyphen being too short or vice versa so don't panic about that it's also a line found kind of um, horizontally in the middle of the the page the page line okay so what is the point of the hyphen well it's a short line similar to the dash and it is used to link words which are normally separate okay look at these three different words these are three different words which are normally written separately but because a brother-in-law is one person they decided that they want to hyphenate this word and make it one so this can be the same um, this is written the same for sister-in-law mother-in-law father-in-law okay we take those three separate words and then we merge them into one to create a brand new word okay and that is the purpose of a hyphen in essence come on guys let's go for a warm-up don't forget to use the sign in sheet okay there's many 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 um different words which we can um so step up to the plate that's another one okay so there's many many different types of words that we hyphenate sometimes when people get married they hyphenate their name um for example say for example the mom's name is mary martinengo and the dad's name is virgo grim she could hyphenate well, they could both hyphenate their name to Martin Ingo Grimm and just put those, merge these two words into one. Now, sometimes when we're writing, we just get overexcited and we write all the end to the end of the page and then we can't fit a very, very long word in at the end. You can use a hyphen, as can be seen here, closed for cleaning. Okay, cleaning couldn't fit on the line, so he goes clean hyphen ing. Right, so that is the point of a hyphen. It often just um, it it merges two words and makes them into one. Um, all of the pictures used today were um, provided by the website unsplash.com. This is to make sure that all of the images used are copyright free. So thank you so much to unsplash.com for helping. And that brings us to the end of our second video. Thank you so much for sticking with me and for learning a bit more about punctuation. I do hope that this helped to clear a few things up. And um, yes, if you have any questions, please feel free to write them below and I will try again and get back to you as soon as possible. Um, oh, I've just written a little note for you. Have you written down the definitions, what these symbols look like and the purpose of each of these punctuation points? Trust me, you're not doing it for me. You're not doing it for anyone else. You're, you're going to thank yourself later. Do something today which your future self will be proud of. Thank you so much, guys. And I hope to, to hear from you, or I hope that you hear from me um, real soon. <laughs> really soon, should I say.